it is great to come here and share a bit about my journey through uh, difficulties and challenges. I arrived in the United Kingdom on the 7th of February, 1969, uh, not 69, 7th of February, 1993, from Nigeria, where I was born and raised. I am one of our other relatives, for other siblings. I am the only lawyer in the family. The rest are medically qualified and accounting. And I loved the vivacity of learning how to be a lawyer and speaking and representing the voices and views of many voiceless people. The arrival in Heathrow Airport was my very first experience of a bitter cold winter's day. I don't know what I expected, but in Nigeria, all those years, you heard that London was the land flowing in milk and honey. I had just been called to the Nigerian bar and I was also a qualified solicitor because it is a fused profession in Nigeria. And I joined Andrew, my husband uh, in Swansea, who, was a law, who is a law lecturer. We were excited to start a married life together. My experience of diversity included Andrew's mom, who's a white English Jewish woman who married a uh, black Nigerian and moved to Nigeria, lived for 52 years in Nigeria. I was very excited because I knew she had a wonderful time in Nigeria and I expected nothing less coming here to start my new journey. I was only 23. I attended the job center to immediately ask if I could apply for jobs. And I recall the white Welsh woman looking at me and saying, what's your name? Said Uzo, short for Uzo Maka, which means the doorway of blessing with a big smile on my face. And she looked at me and said, what? I said, Uzo. She said, I can't say that word. We can't say that word. You better pick a Welsh name, uh, an English name rather. I left, I came in and Uzo, I left to Linda. Linda Iwobi, which I didn't want to be. And she looked at my qualifications and said, what kind of a job are you looking for? And I said, I was uh, hoping to practice law. I did very well and I had my certificates, my double LB qualifications, my bar certificates. She looked at all those and said, you're a very intelligent woman, but I have to tell you that you will never get a job in the legal profession because you're black. That was my first experience of personal racism. I had never thought in my life that a person could be judged, truly judged on their skin color or who they were outside of their character. You read about, um, you read about what happened to people in South Africa, but you find somehow that is distant. You read about the civil rights movement, but you think it's far away in America. You don't think it ever could happen to you. I didn't believe it because I believe I'm very dynamic and very friendly. I did very well in school. My dad was a professor of crop science and worked in the UN and in California. And I thought, goodness, I'm going to challenge this. And so she said, right, from the first of Water Road to number 100, all uh, solicitors firms, good luck. Next, and off I went, 55 applications later. I had one invitation for a civil procedure job by a Welsh man and a Welsh firm. And when I went into that office, I expected at least to have a good crack at this job and have an opportunity. And he interviewed me for one and a half hours on every part of law, legal theory of law, jurisprudence, administrative law, environmental law, criminal law, nothing at all on civil procedure. And at the end of one and a half hours, he said, wow, you're a very smart and intelligent woman. I said, thank you. Does that mean that I get this job? Oh, no, he said. I just wanted to, I literally just wanted to know what they teach you in those countries. There was never any intention to offer me this job. The fact that we had just started life, 
at the time, my husband was a, a very new lecturer and they were, you know, paid about 16,000, running a home, organized the wedding, planned everything and living with parents. It was unbelievable, unbelievable to um, experience such difficulties in securing a job. So I went back to the job center and the woman said to me, forget that you're a barrister. Nobody wants to know here. Don't tell people you were a solicitor. Just use your GCSEs and apply for a bog standard job. I said, what do you mean by that? And she said to me, I feel if you keep telling them uh, that you're a barrister, they'll say you're overqualified. Go and get a job on the shop floor and work your way up. And she sent me packing with um, applications um, for Agos, Tesco's, um, Sainsbury's, Toys R Us. My first job in Wales was selling toys in Toys R Us, £2.40 an hour. And I got a night shift job in Walker's factory where I got put in the VAT duty to clean up all the gunge. Honestly, all the gunge in that VAT. There were only two black people in the whole factory, myself and another African woman. And every single day without fail, every other person got moved to do other jobs. We were always given that job that no white person wanted to do. If you love crisps, wait till you see what's on those crisps. You will run a mile. I don't want to spoil your business if you have shares in the factory. But it was horrendous, especially the smell of cheese and onions. Horrendous. And I remember one day plucking up the courage to challenge the uh, manager. And, and my friend said to me, please don't include my name because you will be sacked. So I went up to the manager and I said, excuse me, why do we always get placed in the vat? Is it because we're black? And he said, are you calling me a racist? Come up here, Linda. And off I went. And he said, why would you ask such a question? You're a troublemaker. I said, no. But every evening you change shifts for all the white people. Only myself and my colleague honestly get put in that vat every single night. He said, what would you rather do? I said, I'd rather sit down and cut crisps. Well, get down there and don't make trouble. I'll see what I can do. That was how I got moved to a different job. My friend was, why didn't you fully talk about me? I said, what you said, don't talk about me. It showed me that not every time will people feel the confidence to challenge. And this is an opportunity for us to stand together in resisting and challenging inappropriate treatment. I could tell you the story of my life. I faced so much challenges. My two children were born here in Wales. And at seven years, my son who'd grown up with a bunch of kids, he was seven. He, the Both of them were the only black children in the whole school. I know another black boy came much later on. And my son was locked in a school toilet and beaten by four white kids. One held the door for 40 minutes. They nearly killed him. He needed hospital treatment because of the injuries he sustained. Because they said, we don't want a black boy in the school. That was the experience of a young child that we sent to school to learn. You send your children to school to be educated, not to be abused and targeted and, and targeted for being black. Why shouldn't they celebrate who they are? Why should anybody be targeted for their skin color? You're born the way you are and you should be able to live a full life. The same experience for my daughter, who's a gifted pianist. She was tortured because of her uh, gift. And people actually stated to her that some of those kids don't come to the school trip. Nobody wants a black girl who's getting A stars for music. If you win another award, you're going to be pushed off the Ivory Tower. And I had to get the teachers to hold the hand of my daughter on a school trip because of threats of abuse. They made her sit on the floor in a courtyard when there was a bench that could have sat up to six children. The racism that is ongoing, we, were, we had graffiti on our car, we had the N-word scratched on the bonnet of our, of our first vehicle from the neighbor, white neighbor we bought it from. We've had people say, F off, go back to your country. You live in the jungle. These are the experiences that caused us to move homes about two or three times. 
I'm telling the story of the modern people of Wales, because in this pandemic, we have seen the rise of racism and the death of Judge Floyd gave voice to a number of young people to articulate their frustration with the current system and the historic, systemic and structural racism that people continue to face in our society today. My life didn't stop in Walker's factory. I became a law lecturer, subsequently a commissioner to the Commission for Racial Equality. And in 2019, during Theresa May's reign, I was invited to be a commissioner on the Centenary Adult Commission. And I sat an interview and applied successfully to become the first black specialist policy advisor on equalities to Welsh government, the first minister, minister for social justice and all the ministers in Welsh government, because I want to be part of that solution that drives change. Through the work we have done, so many people have done, it's not just me, so many incredible selfless individuals have campaigned voraciously um, and with a strong determination not to be quashed. And we campaign for black history to be embedded in the school curriculum here in Wales. And in March, 2021, the Curriculum and Assessment Act was um, uh, actually um, had the, um, oh, sorry, the Curriculum and Assessment Act was included the teaching, the mandatory teaching of black history as part of the school curriculum as a must for every single child, white, black, brown, Asian, whatever, you will learn about the contributions of black children and black people, the Windrush contribution. You will learn about the black history, the first black headmistress and the work she did in her school. And the incredible work also led to my first minister and the, and the minister for social justice leading change in the production of the anti-racist Wales, a race equality action plan, which is a plan that will be not just for Welsh government, but for every single person who operates in any area here in Wales. And to hold, watch my first minister hold up a placard, a photograph of himself with all the uh, cabinet members, all his ministers and the permanent secretary they held up a statement that said, hashtag an anti-racist wills is unprecedented in the history of our Western world. And I am so excited to have played a tiny role in that journey. I remembered leading before I got this job. I remembered leading a team of three or two other people to give a closed evidence session to the National Assembly, now called the Senate Parliament, about the challenges that black people face and the reason that teaching black history in schools will begin to raise the gaze of not just black children, but otherwise ch white children, Asian children, Eastern European children, gypsy traveler, Roma, tra Roma people, about the contributions and the inventions of black people. We are not beggars. We have courage, we have overcome. I come from a lineage that lost three boys to enslavement in the Caribbean islands. And many like me continue to speak out about historic, systemic, structural inequalities. We need to tell the stories of our contributions and what we have done here in Wales. And this is why I am absolutely delighted that Wales is leading the way in terms of ensuring that we embed equality in every fabric of society and truly can see and live in and enjoy an inclusive society where we all have the right to be who we can be and celebrate diversity in all, in all its fullness. I'm so excited to say that it's not just me, so many selfless people have continued to fight this battle and I applaud the First Minister, Professor Mark Drickford, my boss, Jim, Jim Hutt, Minister for Social Justice, and I encourage England, Scotland, Ireland, get behind Wales and let's make this a UK experience. It'd be fantastic to see that. Thank you so much.